Dear friends and colleagues from all over Europe, uh, a warm welcome from the European Movement International headquarters here in Brussels. Um, we're meeting again for another edition of Talking Europe, uh, focusing in the European elections. This time we will be having a digital discussion with a member of the European Parliament, Rasmus Andresen, who is joining us live from his office. Andres, Sir Rasmus, thank you very much for, for joining today. I know you're extremely busy with the campaign, but we were very keen to talk to you before the elections. Um, the past five years have been interesting, to say the least. Many challenges that the EU and Europe at large has to face. Uh, how do you assess the way that the European Union in general, but also the European Parliament in particular, responded to these huge challenges? Well, first of all, let me thank uh, you for organizing this. Um, it's a great opportunity also to discuss um, European policy um, in a different format. So I, I really appreciate it. I think that um, the EU had done a lot to tackle the big um, the big topics in the past years and i think especially the european parliament played an important role for example by pushing the eu commission to do something more on the economic situation with investments in the next generation program as a response to the pandemic but also when it comes to the war in ukraine the parliament had been the strongest ally for Ukraine and support of Ukraine and in um, also criticizing uh, Putin and and the Russian autocrats uh, in uh, and oligarchs. Um, so, so I think that uh, Europe has done a lot and I mean there had been some big challenges and I mean we started out by the Brexit and uh, shortly after we we managed that the pandemic started so it was not a regular term but we uh, went from crisis to crisis and i think compared to um, the big challenges we were able in also tackling them and coming up with some great policies uh, helping the people going through the crisis but of course the challenges are still big and my fear is that if the far right and uh, the enemies of Europe inside and outside of Europe will get stronger than that we are not getting the same opportunity in the next mandate as we had in this. It's very interesting that you mentioned this and it kind of gives me an opening for my next question because all the challenges you touched upon uh, are of global scale. You know, the, the risk to our security from an aggressive Russian president a global pandemic, the environmental crisis uh, that is bringing about climate change, all of these things don't know borders. You know, they don't understand the notion of nation state. They require us pulling our resources together. But then somehow we see the resurgence of far right, often authoritarian politicians with very nationalistic narrative, uh, putting their, themselves or the country first, kind of trying to pull us apart. How can we respond to that narrative, to that messaging, when in fact we need to pull together, but they're prescribing a completely different remedy, one of competition and nationalism. Well, first of all, I think that we need to explain and we need to fight for strengthening the EU and we need to be very clear about that the far right and nationalist doesn't have any kind of answer. And I also think, and this is also my experience during the election campaign here in, in the northern part of Germany and also in Denmark, that people understand that we are stronger together and that some of the global challenges we are facing, like the war, but the economic situation, yeah, but also the pandemic uh, had been an example of that we are better off together. And I think that we need to, to explain that to people. And then I th also think we need to address um, the, the daily problems of ordinary people much better than we did in the past. When it comes to the cost of living crisis, for example, we can see that a majority of European citizens lost uh, income in the past year. So I also think that uh, the social and the economic uh, dimension of the crises we are facing are important to address also at the European level. This is remarkably interesting. And indeed, uh, often it boils down to the economy and uh, people want to have a, a better life, a better future for their children. They want to have equal opportunities. 
and uh, you're absolutely correct. You know, our focus should be there. But again, you know, we can protect our economic prosperity much better when we're indeed working together. Uh, we have noticed in our polling a sharp drop in uh, the support for democracy, exactly because our challenges are so great. And often, you know, the solutions, the answers we offer take a while to materialize. People are losing trust a little bit with democracy. We have seen that they're toying with the idea of, you know, maybe having a strong leader, it's uh, easier to f- generate solutions. And again, you know, when you cast your ballot once every five years or every four years, depending on the election, and you don't see results with it, for it, you are starting to doubt whether it's worth voting at all. How else can we strengthen our democracy? How can we make it a bit more participatory to give the opportunity to our fellow citizens to engage in the process beyond just voting? Well, first of all, I agree. This is a big uh, challenge and a big problem that people, many people, too many people think that like the EU is not important enough for their daily life. So we need to address this both economically and socially. But of course, we also need uh, to uh, strengthen the rights of, of different people coming from minority backgrounds, for example, to be much more inclusive and to give also the people a clear vision of uh, what Europe also could mean to strengthen their rights. And then I think there are some concrete measures where I think that with citizen panels, for example, um, we can also include young uh, people and also older people, but I think um, especially young people better also in the uh, policy process because uh, I, I know that a lot of people are frustrated about that they are maybe doesn't feel represented in our European democracy. So there I think we also need to find some more... Uh, some better processes when it comes to the participation of ordinary people. Um, and I think this is especially also up to the European Parliament to ensure that we are getting stronger when it comes to this. And I think the whole process of the Conference of Europe, where citizens from all countries in different ages and gender uh, had the possibility also to discuss and also to come up with recommendations on how Europe should look like, was a very good step. But now I also think we need to follow up on this and the member states needs to be ready to uh, to invite to a uh, a convent like like the parliament uh, is demanding so that people also can see that some of their demands also uh, will be taken up from from politicians indeed indeed it's a time for bold uh, measures and, uh, and ambitious uh, steps and it's great to see that the parliament has been very supportive of that uh, inclusion into the mix of participatory democracy which doesn't doesn't replace representative democracy it complements it it strengthens it in many ways now, as a final question, perhaps if we can look into the future, you know, if we find ourselves again at the same place five years from now, at the end of the mandate, uh, hopefully with you elected and again in there, uh, what would you like, what would be your main ambitions for the next five years? Uh, what do you think will be uh, important achievements for the EU, the European Parliament, but also yourself as a member of the European Parliament for the next term? Well, I think there are. T- three topics. First of all, I think the EU needs to reform itself, meaning we need to uh, abolish anonymity in the council so that there will be majority decisions on important elements so that we are not uh, um, giving a veto power to people like Viktor Orban. Um, we need to strengthen the role of the parliament uh, so that we have also the right for legislation. Uh, we need to follow up on the green transition and we need to do this in a social manner. And the last one is that I think we need uh, to become bigger, meaning that we need to give some member states, uh, some, some, some states, European states, not member states yet on the Balkans, but also Ukraine, the perspective of joining the EU. Maybe not in four or five years but in 10, but we need to be much closer to that goal um, at the end of the next term. That is indeed a truly ambitious agenda for the next few years, and uh, we look forward to cooperating with you and many other like-minded members of the European Parliament. 
Uh, it was a real pleasure having us with you, with us, having you with us. Uh, we wish you the best for your campaign. I know the Thanks. final stretch is the challenging one, and we look forward to working with you again. Thank you so much. All the best to Brussels.